Thank you everyone for tuning in to today's show of the Neil Coote Show and today I have a guest by the name of Charles Fernandez. Charles is a, uh, let's say, he runs his own printing company as well as that he is also the host of the Business Hour. So thank you very much for coming on to the show there today, Charles. No problem at all, Neil. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome, mate. So Charles, tell me a bit about yourself. Um. Where would you like me to start? How long? Oh, well, you can start as far back as high school and uh, where you grew up and, yeah, to, let's take it from there. Uh, to, put a, to probably put a bit of context into it, I'll, I'll start from um, my, my sort of childhood. So yeah. I was born in Malaysia. Okay. Parents moved here when I was uh, five years old. So um, first generation, or we are migrants. Um, went to school. I, um, I was about 12, 13 years old. I wanted a PlayStation, and my parents were like, "Well, you gotta, you gotta earn your pocket money to do it." I'm like, "Okay." But the problem with that was, I wanted instant gratification, so I wanted to be able to buy it quickly. And washing the car was only getting me like five dollars or four dollars or whatever it was. Mowing the lawn was only getting me, you know, two or three dollars. So it was a case where I realised I couldn't just rely on the chores around the house to get paid for those to be able to buy my PlayStation quickly. So me and a couple of my buddies, and I had different buddies for different areas, um, we started going around and knocking on doors and washing people's cars. So very quickly I was able to buy a PlayStation. I bought. I still remember I bought 12 games and I bought the top of the range uh, scorpion gun with the recoil and all that sort of stuff um, and that taught me an uh, incredible lesson in life about being able to take control of um, how much money you make and, and what you do and also the drive and the motivation behind what you do. I wanted that PlayStation so badly that I was willing to go and wash cars and knock on doors and do things like that. Um, you know, I think I honestly, I think I played that PlayStation for about six months. I'm not much of a gamer at all, but at the time I wanted it, and and that's what I did. So um, from there, I went through went through high school, uh, went through uni, uh, Swinburne Uni, studied business, um, ran some nightclubs while I was in uni. So um, that was that was an entertaining time period of my life. That was uh, partying four or five nights a week, which is um, which is pretty cool. Um, and then uh, worked corporate, went through call center, account managers, um, those sort of roles, became redundant and decided that the next thing I was going to do was something that I was going to be passionate about. So I started my own marketing business, which was always something that I had done um, in previous um, sort of roles. Like even when I was running nightclubs, I was very passionate about the marketing side of things and how to do things differently. So it was a sort of a natural fit for me to start a marketing business. And at the time when I first started, it was actually a digital business. Um, a lot of it was uh, social media website based. But back then, you know, going back five, six years, it was very hard to transact with people when you're offering a service that's not tangible. So telling someone the value of um, a social media strategy or having a really good user interface for their website was a hard sell. Um, so what I realized was people were asking for a lot of, uh, it was easier to, to transact with people on tangible products. For example, business cards, if you tell someone it's $100 for 500 business cards, that's a product and that's tangible and you can make that exchange and they can see that value. So it was a lot easier for me to transact with people on printing products. So that's the direction that, that I took the business in. Um, and so bought some printing equipment, um, landed some decent clients, landed some big clients. So we do some work for some national and multinational clients um, on a regular basis. And as of recently, we've sort of started pivoting back towards the digital space where we build websites and we do social and marketing strategies, but it's not, we're not competing against um, the lower end of the market. So there's a lot of people out there, especially on things like Fiverr and Upwork and all those sort of places where you can build a website for a couple hundred bucks 
we don't compete with those sort of guys. We compete with the guys that are looking for a long-term strategy, looking to build something uh, bigger than than what those sort of uh, websites can offer. So that's um, that's sort of taken me to to where I am today. There's, there's been some other projects along the way, like Hex Fight Series that I started, and um, the, which is the biggest MMA promotion in Australia today. I think um, they've released more fighters in the last couple of years to the UFC than any other promotion around the world. Um, Dog House, which is a dog-only uh, cafe in Collingwood. Um, and then um, the most recent project that I'm working on, which is which is just gone live, is called Backed Off, which is an antimicrobial film that we apply to surfaces. It lasts five years and it kills 99.9% of bacteria. So with everything going on in the world at the moment, um, there's definitely a gap in this space. And I think there's a heightened awareness for cleanliness and high demand for a higher level of hygiene. So this is a product that that I strongly believe in and I think will will make communities safer and, and give businesses and, and consumers more confidence in going out and interacting with, with others in, in retail. So that's, um, yeah, that's something that I'm literally launching as we speak. Oh, wow. So this um, Doghouse Cafe, um what inspired you behind it? Um, what is it? Interesting question. So um, I've always loved dogs and um, my business partners have always loved dogs as well when, when we started that. And I used to feed my dog a lot of raw meat. Um, and I was buying – I always just assumed it was normal meat that I was buying beef and just giving her raw meat. And I realised um, after a little bit of time that – she'd be vomiting this meat that I would give her. And I couldn't work out why. So then I started talking to some butchers and people in the meat industry, and they're telling me that the meat that I'm buying is definitely coming from a knackery. Yep. So for those that don't know what that is, that's where um, disease stock or dead stock or whatever go, and it gets minced and they make all sorts of things out of it. But it's not definitely not for human consumption um it could be disease it might not be disease but it's 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 not what i would put in my body yeah if i wouldn't do it i wouldn't feed my dog that um so when i realized that and uh when i realized that i I made i was shocked about what i was feeding my dog because i thought i was giving her good food i thought i was giving her meat and you know as a treat i thought I i was doing the right thing so when i realized that um, this stuff was like, I felt cheated. So what I, I literally did a post on Facebook that went absolutely viral. I said, if there was a restaurant for dogs, who would go? And my idea wasn't to start a restaurant or a cafe. At the time, it was to start a food delivery business for dogs, delivering fresh food, but quality product that has some kind of standing, that it's not just some fall on stock or disease stock or whatever it is. Some delivering a consistent product and, and doing it on almost like a like a light and easy sort of model, yep. but for pets. Um, wow. But then when I put up that post and I said, who would who would go, um, who would take their dog to a dog restaurant, we literally got absolutely smashed by every every news outlet. Like if you look at it today, it still um, it still pops up on my on my Facebook memories and things, but every major news like channel 7, 9, 10, Nova, MTV, you, you name it, they jumped on it and they were, it, was, it went absolutely mental, the, um, the exposure we got from it because it was just, it was such a new concept that, that no one had done and there are a lot of dog lovers in Melbourne or Australia in general that, um, that spoil their dogs and treat their dogs really well and it was a, it was a unique place to take their dogs to, to give them a treat. Okay, so yeah, it is... It is quite a unique idea, and um, these days uh, pets are like family members, you know, so people want to give the best for their pets, and, you know, obviously taking them out to a cafe, it's also a bit of a bonding experience as well where the owner can have with their pets. Um, so, yeah, that is quite a unique unique idea there. Um, did you have any challenges trying to establish the business, or was it just straight off the bat it was successful? Um. No, we de- definitely had challenges, definitely. 
I think any business that you start, you're going to have um, teething problems or challenges at the start, especially if it's not a business that you've done before. Because every every business presents itself with, with unique challenges. Um, one of the things was early on was to find a suitable location. So to find a place that had a indoor and outdoor area um, that was central, where the rent was affordable. Um, I mean, now now if you look at things, it's a lot different. You know, tenants and, and potential tenants have got their cards in their hands with, with everything that's gone on with coronavirus and, and all that sort of thing. But, um, you know, when we were looking at, at starting up, it wasn't the case. Um, looking in the city and in the suburbs that we were looking at, the price was, was really expensive. Um, we actually had meetings with a couple of um, landlords and they wanted to see a proposal about what we were going to do. And they, everyone told us we were going to fail. Yeah. So yeah. everyone said, no, it's not going to work. Mm. Um, and so for that reason, some, some landlords refused to, to even give us, a sh- give us a go. Even though we, um, we were quite well financially backed, um, so there wasn't really a huge risk on their, on their part. They just didn't believe in the concept. So um, that, that was one of the things early on. Um, and then in establishing the business itself, uh, one of the other challenges is um, the, the way – so there's a, there's a human cafe as part of the business. So if you're going there and you take your dog, you get your dog a dogachino and a muffin or whatever it is, and then you go and get yourself a coffee. So there's that, there's that human part of the, the cafe as well. So having those two elements, with meat and things like that, there's a lot of um, – requirements in terms of um, how things need to be laid out, structure and, and all that sort of thing. So because selling meat is the Department of Agriculture and, and you've got certain requirements for that, then human cafe, you've got certain council requirements you need to meet, you know, you can't have dog hair everywhere and, you know, things like that. So there, there was a lot of things that we needed to, a lot of murky waters that we needed to navigate because, again, because it's, whenever you do something new, it's, it's unprecedented, and the easiest answer for anyone to give you is no. Yeah. Um, you know, like yeah. So any any time would ask a question, if it was too hard, someone would just say no. Um, and then yeah, I mean, eventually we got there and we got off the ground, but that's just some of the some of the challenges that we found. Was it easy to get the council permits? You know, because the whole food handling side of it. Um. Yeah, I mean, we had a we had a pretty good, uh, pretty solid layout and pretty solid plan on how we we're gonna um, maintain hygiene and keep the dog section separate and, and things like that. So we went in um, prepared and, and knowing um, a lot of that stuff. One of my my business partner AJ was uh, responsible for a lot of that, and he he was well versed in the requirements that were needed and things like that. So. Yeah, that, that made it easier. So it's, it's really important to be well planned out before you execute any business idea, correct? Uh, absolutely. Um, the last thing you want to do is to run into a whole heap of red tape that you can't get out of. Um, you know, things like knowing, knowing what's required for your business. Um, if you're buying an existing business, making sure that they've got the relevant permits and approvals from from council about what they're doing and their their practices are all above board. You know things like that. It's it's so important to to research because you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you're prohibited from trading or you can't. You know they shut you down until you comply with certain things. You know you can't. You just can't afford that, especially especially in new business when you're already struggling to to you know get revenue and make a profit, turn a profit, those sort of things are, can, can set you back and can be fatal to, to a new business. Okay. So um, did social marketing work a lot for you with this business? Um, was it easy with the whole social – like did you use a lot of social marketing or was it um, more like offline marketing when it came to promoting your business? Um, I would talk – are we talking just doghouse specifically? Yeah, yeah, or? just in doghouse in general. Yeah, doghouse? yeah, um, yeah. I think 
I'd say 95% of it was social. So um, we sold it um, a couple of years ago, but up until that point, we'd grown it to, I think there's about 14,000 um, people on, on Instagram and about 10,000 or something on, on Facebook. And it was almost those numbers when, when we had it. So I don't know that the new owners have really capitalized on the social side of things, but when we had it, it definitely made an impact. And one of the biggest things that um, people need to understand is the psychology behind different platforms. Yeah. So if you talk about Instagram, there are people out there that will literally go to different restaurants to buy food, to take a photo of that dish and put it on the Instagram page. Oh, wow. So if you understand that, that sort of mindset, then you understand that people will go and take their dog to dog house to buy a dog a chino and a muffin just to take the photo and just to post it on social media. So oh, okay. there's, there's that market as well as there's the market of um, there's different there's different markets. So you gotta you gotta understand the psychology behind each market to be able to really capitalize on social. It's if you're just putting up posts without any sort of intention, you're not gonna get a massive result. Um, but yeah, social was a massive part of uh, the marketing makeup of Doghouse. Oh, okay, so just in general, right? Um, being that you run your own marketing company, um, is offline marketing still as effective as it was, say, twenty years ago, or has the world sort of shifted towards more social, you know, social media type of marketing? That's a really good question. Um, I think, I think the answer to that question is not as relevant as it depends on what type of business it is. Yeah. And it also comes back to marketing is all about attention. So if you talk to me about if I, if you were a new client, I'd ask you a lot of questions about who you were targeting and why you were targeting that group and, and what your typical customer looks like. And then we work out whether that type of person, you'd have to draw some generalizations, but would that type of person be on, more likely to engage with someone on social media or would they be more likely to read the newspaper or would they be more likely to be listening to talk like radio or would they be influenced by their children on social media and on their platforms or grandchildren? So a lot of people will, will jump to the conclusion that Social media is killed off every other um, platform, and that that's a common sort of assumption that people make. But it doesn't always necessarily reign true. Your bang for buck would always be determined by um, the reach that you can get to your market. So I'll give you an example. Pick a top pick pick a business for me, and I'll give you an example. Okay, so um, cleaning service. Cleaning service. Okay. So I would argue, without, without doing any research, I would argue that if you were able to do an effective mail drop to businesses in um, high-density business areas and industrial parks, and when I say an effective mail drop, you don't want to end up rolled up with your Coles and Woolies catalogs. Because yeah. what people do is they take the whole lot and they put it on the bin. So if you were able to structure something in such a way or include a gift or something that bulks it up and makes the person take note of that mail drop and you do that into a specific area of, um, like I said, businesses or industrial parks or whatever it might be, I would argue that you would get a higher ROI on that than you would spending your money on Facebook. Okay. Because it's harder to target business owners and, and facilities managers and things like that on um, Facebook. You might have a, you might have a decent um, return on LinkedIn, but again, LinkedIn can be, can be very expensive to advertise on. So. Okay, so print media still does work, but it really just depends on the industry that you're targeting, whether it will work for it or not. It depend, I think it depends on who you're targeting and also the execution is very important of how you go about it. That's the same with online. It's the same with online. If you, if you, 
have a, a crappy ad for an awesome burger restaurant and you have a, like a, a very average burger photo, you, you're not going to do it justice and it's not going to work, whether it's print or online or anything else. You know what I mean? So it dep- the execution, I think, is, is extremely important as well. Is, it, is that why, like, you know, when you see the McDonald's per, uh, burgers in the photos, they look massive and beautiful and then when you get there, they're not quite as good as what the photo looks. Is that right? Well, yeah, I mean, they're obviously going to represent um, what they want people to see. Yeah. And I think they – I read somewhere a while ago, it takes them like four to six hours to photograph a burger. Oh, wow. Um, so, you know, just getting things perfect and getting all the different angles and lighting and everything. So, yeah, I mean, they, that, that's one of the reasons that they do it. And, and like you just pointed out, that's a very good point. Look to the biggest um, companies in your industry and work out what they're doing because they've spent so much time researching everything to do with their with their product that you can tap into that information for a fraction of that cost. All it takes you is the time. Okay, so researching your competitors will give you help you get the a bit of an advantage because you won't yourself have to spend money on doing your own initial research because the research is already done there for you, yeah? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just going to make up an example here. Yeah. Like, for example, if, if I was to start a small supermarket, yeah, the first thing I would do, I would go into Coles and, and maybe Woolies as well and measure the width of their fridge doors because okay. I can almost guarantee you that there has been some science done to establish that doors that are um, X centimeters wide that are glass will promote people to reach in and grab that product or to be to appear more appealing or whatever it is so don't go and reinvent the wheel if you if you're getting into a business or you are in a business that um, has got some really big players look at what the what they're doing when you when you say researching your competitors be careful because it also means that you need to differentiate your product enough to for people to come to you. So yeah. don't don't copycat people. Just look, observe, and take in the good things that, that someone else might be doing and then, you know, put your own spin on it and, and um, make sure that it's different enough and, and your unique proposition is compelling enough for people to come and interact with you. Okay. So um, with the social uh, media marketing side of things with business, is it an easy task to do or does it require a lot of planning and stuff like that when it comes to utilizing social media? Um, again, I'd say it depends on the business because um, I'll give you an example. So if you're a restaurant, you want to be pretty active on your social. Yeah. You want to be promoting new menu items. Um, if you're a franchise, you want to be promoting uh, new locations that are opening up. Um, you want to promote different events that are coming up, like Mother's Day, Father's Day, you know, all those sort of things, Valentine's Day, etc., to promote um, bookings. If you're a plumber yeah. or electrician, it's not as important. Okay. Social will keep you at the forefront of people's minds, sure. But so I believe that social plays a different role for, for businesses like that. The role that it sort of plays is it provides a portfolio of work that you've done before. So, for example, if I was to ask you, Neil, have you got a plumber that I can use? And you'll say, hey, use ABC Plumbers. The first thing that I'm going to do is type ABC Plumbers into Google. Yeah. It might come up with their website, might come up with their social. Then I'm going to be able to see what their standard of work is, what their what their messaging is, how they communicate, etc. And then I'm going to make a decision from there whether I'm going to contact them or not. So I think it plays different, um, depending on the business, determines how involved you need to be on social media. But again, coming back to your question about how much time it takes, it can be time consuming. You need to, people that don't plan are going to find themselves, they're the ones that will end up saying that social doesn't work. Okay. So having a really strong strategy behind what you're posting, how you're posting, the times you're posting, 
having consistency in your messaging, um, having goals on what you're trying to actually achieve, that's all very important. So if you haven't got all that, you're probably spraying and praying. Like you, yeah. you're spending money, you might be spending money or spending a lot of time anyway, creating all this content, but it's not going in any particular direction. So you're going to say that, you know, it's not working. So, um, so yeah. these different platforms, you've got the Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, they, do they all have like a different role to play when it comes to marketing? Like do, do they have their own agendas or like you say, Instagram is about people taking photos of the meals and stuff like that. So I get a bit of an idea. Instagram's all about photos, but what about these other platforms? Yeah, so interesting. So the the, um, the fastest growing, growing platform at the moment is TikTok. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with TikTok, yeah. but it's all um, it's all you know all the all the videos and, and that sort of stuff. So um, that's the fastest growing platform. The predominant age group on there is thirteen to seventeen. So if you're targeting, um, you know, adolescents, teenagers, or even even if you're targeting post that age group, if you're targeting 18 to 21, you want to be able to plant the seed early enough. So you need to be active on TikTok. Um, if you're a B2B business, you really want to be active on LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn today is offering more bang for buck than Facebook did five or seven years ago in terms of its organic reach. And the articles that you publish can have a far greater um, audience that, that it can get to. So um, B2B is definitely, definitely on um, LinkedIn. There's a lot of B2B on uh, Facebook as well. Um, Twitter is not massive in Australia, I don't think. It's, funnily enough, a lot, it's used by a lot of um, people in farming and agriculture to notify each other and to communicate. But in terms of um, marketing on Twitter, I'll put that probably below any other social platform. So I think the most common, obviously, your Facebook and your Instagram. Um, there's a lot of action on, on Facebook and Instagram, followed by LinkedIn, and then you know there's a few others like Snapchat and TikTok and things like that. But it really depends on the audience that you're trying to target. So, um, basically, if someone wanted to start their own business, they've really got to look within themselves and see what they're trying, what their target audience is, and then basically go out and research all the different platforms out there um, to see. Which what one best suits them before they start executing their business? Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Sit down and work out your um, sit down and work out a solid marketing plan. And as part of that, you will identify your different target markets. So you might have multiple target markets within your business. Um, work out who is in each in each of those target markets, and really create a very solid picture about what they look like, who they are, what their interests are, where they like to go and socialize, what what kind of social media platforms they're on, who are their friends, who like what are they doing, etc. So you know how to target them. All marketing is is, is like I said, it's it's attention. So you've got a business, you've got a potential customer or your target market. It's getting a message that resonates to that group and for them to interact with that message. That's all marketing is. So with all these other platforms out there, is it really necessary to have a website? Um, is it necessary to build a website or can you just rely on these platforms? Um, I, I would be very wary and I would not – recommend anyone to go all in on one particular platform. Okay. The reason is 10 years ago, if you spent $100 on Instagram, uh, on Facebook, sorry, you would get a massive ROI. You might you might yield $10,000 off $100. Yeah. If you spent $1,000 today, you might only get back $2,000 or $2,500 in revenue. So... The point that I'm trying to make is that the more people that advertise, the better it is for these companies, but your dollar doesn't go as far. So when you talk about organic reach, for example, um, the organic reach on, on Instagram has dropped off in the last 24 months massively. 
Um, before that, you could use the right hashtags to get in front of, in front of a lot more people. Now it doesn't work the same way. Um, so today, what I was saying before, LinkedIn has got a massive organic reach. That might change with their next algorithm update. So yeah. I think that creating your own website creates your own point of presence that's stable. That's, that's your point of reference. That's your space on the internet where people go to to find you. Oh, All okay. these social medias and, and capitalizing on what, what each of them are doing is great for driving traffic, but you should be driving traffic ultimately to your platform, which is your website. Oh, okay. And what do you mean by organic? Organic is non-paid. So anything that you're not having to pay for to get in front of people. Is there any rules um, or things you should think of when you're trying to organically stimulate or generate uh, interest? The best type of content is the content that, that goes viral. Right? Yeah. So if you make your content shareable, if you relate to different people and you, you talk about tof- topics that affect them that are topical at the moment, you're more likely to get engagement from people and more likely, if it's good advice, more likely for people to share it to their friends. So, yeah. So would it, would it, is it recommended or not recommended to... You know, do some advertising with memes. Again, it depends on your um, depends on the business, the communication that you want to put out there, because you want to be consistent. For example, if you're, uh, it wouldn't be appropriate for a law firm to put out memes. Okay. Do you know what I mean? They're, yeah. they're a serious sort of professional business. Um, whereas, if it was for um, a blogger doing a food review, maybe it might be uh, mm. more more suitable. So. You got to take it. You got to take everything into context. Okay. So, um, apart from that, like I was just curious to ask you a bit about your printing business. Um, you said you just bought a bunch of equipment. Yeah. Um, what drove you to go towards print? Um, yeah, print media and stuff like that. Um. Uh, well, I guess the printing side of things was when. Um, so when I started, it was all mainly digital and. Like I said, I was finding it hard to transact with people. And I'm a firm believer that the market's always right. You're not right. I'm not right. The market's always right. Mm -hmm. So if my product or my service positioning for websites and social media and digital services is not resonating with the market and I'm not getting customers, that's because what I'm offering is not aligned with what the market needs at the moment. So... The feedback or the more the questions or inquiries I was getting was around, hey, do you do business cards? Because when I set up someone's website, normally a new business. So it's say, hey, do you do, do, you do uh, business cards? Do you have posters that I can get? Do you have, um, you know, things that they need to start a new business in terms of print collateral? So that's what sort of drove me in that direction, just because of, the inquiries that I was getting and I knew that there was a market for it from from the inquiries I was getting as opposed to any research that I had to do. So that's why I went in that, in that direction. Is it easy to build a website or is it always it's pop, is it better recommended that you hire someone to build a website for your business? It depends again on what you're trying to achieve from, from the website and, and your business long term. Um, there are a lot of things out there that can help you build a, a pretty simple basic website. There's Wix, there's um, Squarespace and all those sort of things. But again, it depends on what you want and how much, um, how effective you want your website to be. For example, uh, we install heat maps on all of our clients' websites to, to identify uh, potential areas of improvement, to let us know the hotspots on the website where people are really um, resonating with the imagery and, and text that are in those areas um, so that we can continually improve on those websites, um, which is something that you're, you're probably not going to get when you have a, a basic sort of do-it-yourself service. Um, there's they- also a lot of things about um, codes and how they work in the back end and mm. um, how things feed into one another. For example, Instagram feeds on, on people's websites and then we capture when someone sends an inquiry on, on a lot of our clients' websites, we capture that data, which goes into a database, so they're remarketed against 
against that and Facebook pixels. There's, there's a whole there's a whole bunch of things that go into a complete website package. But to answer your question, if someone was to today go out and say, "Hey, I want a website for my plumbing service," they can make a website on, on one of these platforms and not have too much trouble with it. ongoing and things like that and how it's going to rank and all that sort of stuff. I can't can't give you an answer. Yeah, but they can. There are things out there. So they they are somewhat effective uh, when you're starting out a business. You you know people can use these services and they will help them out. Yeah, you can. But like I said, like I said as well, um, you don't want to be doing things multiple times and paying over and over, especially when you're starting out. Yeah. Um, one of the most common things that people make the mistake of is branding. Yeah. They go onto a, a website that. Um, offers them logos really cheap mm. and they'll buy the logo. They don't get the high resolution files. The logo might look good to them, but there's no psychology or no science put into the thought of the design of that logo. And when you talk about um, the subconscious reacting to different images and logos, it's very, very powerful. So when you go to one of those things, you might get a fancy, fancy logo that you like, that's cool, but there's a lot of science that goes behind behind a logo when you're actually developing it. You know, the colours represent different things to people, um, the shapes and images and how it all comes together. So you don't want to be doing things multiple times or rebranding because it can actually cost you more long term than doing things correctly up front. So my, my biggest recommendation would be to do some research and to speak to people. You know, speak if, – if you're thinking about building a website, evaluate it yourself. So – write a list of pros and cons for each way of doing it, whether it's Wix, Squarespace, getting a local developer to do it, outsourcing it to Upwork. Evaluate yourself and ultimately you've got to make a commercial business decision about what you think is is right for your your position. Okay. So what are some of the common mistakes you've seen people do when starting a business? Um, the biggest thing is they start up for the wrong reasons. Okay. They, some people are under the illusion that um, it's great to have your own business because you get to work your own hours. You, you're not working your own hours. You're working the hours. You don't have one boss. You have 300 bosses because every one of your clients, if they turn around and they get rid of you, they've just fired you. So that that's going to hurt your bottom line. Then yeah. You don't get paid when you get fired in, in this sort of scenario. So you work the hours that you're required to based on the demands of your customer. Unless you're doing something that's so specialized that everyone wants you, which is, you know, is few and far between, you're working the hours that you have to to service your customers. So some people are, yeah, a lot of people are under the, the impression that, you know, you you work for yourself, you work your own hours and they see they they might see a glimpse of enjoying yourself or buying something and they're like, oh, wow, I wonder, I wish I could own my own business. But they don't see the 18-hour days, six days a week, working Saturdays and Sundays, missing out on, on significant occasions and events and people having parties and you can't go because you've got work to do or you need to deliver on a project or whatever it might be. So there's a lot of sacrifices that you need to make when you start, especially at the start of, of a new business. So I think that's that's the biggest thing. And People, I think that goes hand in hand with something that you're not passionate about. I okay. think those two things. So the illusion of, of, you know, freedom of working your own hours and, and doing what doing what you please, that's one. And the, the second thing is the um, not being passionate about something. You know, you shouldn't, um, shouldn't be doing something just for the money. If that's the reason of doing it, you're going to find, you're going to find very quickly that, you're out of reasons to actually shop to work. Like, it's if you're not passionate about doing something, you know, some jobs might blow out, and you know, for whatever reason, mistakes happen and, and things like that. And when you go back and calculate it, you might be working for you know four or five dollars an hour. Yeah. But if you're working for someone else, you'd be getting you know a, a lot more, a lot more than that. So if you're not passionate about it, you're not going to last. So it's quite easy to get burnt out if you're not passionate about what you're doing. Absolutely. Oh, awesome. Um, 
Well, not, that's not awesome, but yeah, uh, it's good to know that, you know, um, yeah, that people have to be really passionate about what they do and not really look at the dollar figures. Um, and if they're passionate about what they do, um, eventually they'll, they put enough effort into it, they'll become successful and, you know, um, the money will basically just flow in after that. Is that right? I think so. I think that um, if you're truly passionate about something, pe- people sense that. And when that sort of energy is contagious and it speaks volumes to people that interact with you and they take on that passion and they're confident in dealing with you. Do you know what I mean? You, you walk into a pizza, pizza, pizza place and the guy looks miserable and he doesn't want to be there. I don't want to buy pizza from him. Yeah. But I, I walk into a place and the guy's excited and he's telling you about the new pizza that he's created and the new dough machine that he's got or whatever it is. You can tell he's passionate about it. I want to buy a pizza from him because it's it's the it's the energy that he's putting out that that makes me want to you know take interest in what he's doing. Yeah. So um, I know you've you know you've dropped a lot of gems here in this show today, um, but what would be your top three tips uh, to that people should be um, apply or be aware of um, when starting their own business? What would you recommend them as your top three tips? Um, I'd say have a really good think about it. Have a really good think about um, whether the reasons why you want to start a business because a lot of people get caught up in the romance of what they think it's going to be like when they start a business. If you look at the statistics, they're all stacked against you. All the statistics are stacked against you in terms of um, how much, if you're going to survive for the first 12 months, um, how profitable you're going to be, whether you're going to last five years, all those stats are stacked against you. So have a really good think about why. And this is not me discouraging people from starting their own business. I'm just saying go in with your eyes wide open. So um, one, have a really good think about why you're doing it um, and Make sure that you're passionate about it. Um, two, make sure that you're um, well resourced in terms of when you sit down and you plan, make sure that you're not going to end up in a cash flow trap or you can't afford to buy raw materials or your payment terms are added. All those sort of things. Make sure that you're, you've planned financially. Um, three, I'd say to set some goals about what you're trying to achieve and short, and that's short term and long term. So whatever it is, you've got to have, you know, especially at the start or even when you're, when it's just an idea, you might have daily, weekly, monthly goals while you're getting up and off the ground. Um, like to give you an idea with this current project, things like um, designing business cards, designing t-shirts, incorporating the company, registering the trademarks, they're things that offset in terms of almost like a daily basis. So I know that, yes, it's a checklist, but they're also my goals short term to get it up get it up and running. So I think um, those, those three things are probably the most important. So regular goal setting on a daily basis would be important for success, is that right? Well, I think, look, the daily basis, I think at the start, when it's a very new idea, you've got a lot of things to achieve in a very short period of time. I think it's appropriate daily at that point. Um, when you're actually up and running, you don't want to be shifting the goalpost every every day. You want to have, a, you know, maybe a, a monthly, quarterly, yearly, five yearly, bi yearly strategy um, or goal, rather. Um, or it could be a series of goals. You know, you might want to have goals to pick up revenue in a certain category of your business or to increase profit margins by acquiring X type of client or whatever it might be. That would be a goal that you would set. You wouldn't necessarily set daily goals in, in a business that's running because it wouldn't it wouldn't foster uh, consistency for for the organisation. Okay, look, um, I'll wrap it up from here for now. But look, I appreciate your time here today on the show. Thank you very much for coming on to the show there today, Charles. No problem at all, Neil. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Um, now for everyone out there. Um, I'll put a 
basically uh, Charles's links down below in the description. You can reach out to him. Is that okay, Charles, if people reach out to you? Please, no problem at all. So, yeah, I'll put down his links. Now, if you really enjoyed today's show, don't forget to smash like on the thumbs up button down there on the left-hand side and um, hit subscribe uh, to the channel, uh, the Neil Coots Show. And, uh, yeah, just hit the notification bell there as well um, so you can hear about newer episodes. But from here on the Neil Coots Show with Charles, uh, Charles Fernandez, thank you very much and uh, have a good day. Eyes in the sky, gazing far into the night, I raise my hand.